Good morning and good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to today's webcast, Breaking In and Breaking Records, a look back at 2016 cyber crimes. I'm Kate Carson, Marketing Events Specialist at Tripwire, and I'm excited to be part of this webcast today. It is our final webcast of the year, so thank you for being here. Before we start, I'd like to go over a few housekeeping items. First, make sure that your audio is streaming correctly. Please note that the audio portion will stream through your PC or laptop speakers. Be sure to check your speaker volume, the volume setting on your computer, and your headset to ensure that it is turned on and volume is at an audible level. Today's presentations will be using a slide deck. You can click on the expand rectangle on the top right corner of the slide area to enlarge. If you're not seeing the slide movement in your console, you can try refreshing your browser. If you're experiencing technical difficulty, please click on the Help widget. It's the question mark icon on your console and covers most common technical questions and issues. If you have a question during the presentation, click on the Q&A widget and submit your question. We will have a Q&A session at the end of the presentation. And feel free to submit comments via this widget as well. Lastly, I'll be sending out a follow-up email with the link to the on-demand webcast and the slide deck. So now let's get on with the presentation. Our presenters today are Travis Smith, Senior Security Researcher at Tripwire, and Chris Conacher, Manager Security Content and Research at Tripwire. They're going to take us down memory lane of cybercrime this year. So now, without further delay, I'm going to send it over to Travis Smith. Take it away, Travis. Thanks a lot, Kate. Hi, everybody. My name is Travis Smith, and I am a security researcher here with Tripwire. Uh, uh, my role is to actively look at threats that we are facing every day uh, over the course of um, you know, just what's recent in the market to what we're seeing over an expanded set of time over you know, months or years and uh, how we can address those in you know, creative ways through Tripwire products. Uh, I'm excited today because we also have uh, my manager, Chris Conacher, here, who is the manager of our security and content uh, research team. And Chris, why don't you give the uh, folks here a little background about yourself. Hi everyone, um, so glad to be here with Travis doing this today. Um, so I'm the manager for security content and research team, which is one of the engineering and security research teams within Tripwire. Um, we've got a number of those. We may be giving a shout out to a couple of those within this webcast. Um, but with that short introduction, I'll hand you back to Travis. Excellent. So today we're going to be going over uh, a few of the major events that we saw in 2016 and you know, kind of give a little bit of information about them, uh, you know, at least from our perspective here at Tripwire, uh, you know, what happened uh, and some of the lessons learned that uh, we've taken away and tried to adapt into our products and solutions. So, in, uh, over the past few years, actually, it's not just 2016, we've seen a huge rise in ransomware. Uh, it's kind of been around for uh, well over a decade, but uh, probably over the last maybe 24, 36 months, we've seen an increase in uh, the, the rise of uh, reported infections. This is probably mainly due to the adoption of uh, cryptocurrency and you know, you know, a, a pseudo-anonymous way to get paid from the, you know, from the attacker standpoint. And usually we'd see these things in the you know the range of you know a couple hundred dollars, maybe up to you know seven eight hundred dollars um, for you know what the ransom was. But usually anywhere from you know one bitcoin down to maybe a fraction of a bitcoin is what they were trying to get. And attackers, your the victims would pay this, uh, and the the attackers were really re uh, relying on economies of scale to to get paid. In February of this year, we saw a. a uh, kind of a, a jump to more targeted ransomware attacks. We saw the Hollywood Presbyterian Medical Center uh, down in Southern California get infected with the ransomware, which was you know targeted for a healthcare provider. And instead of a, a, you know just wanting you know one or you know a fraction of a bitcoin, they asked for nine thousand bitcoins, which equated to you know roughly three point four million dollars in ransom is what they were asking for. Uh, so you know really jumped the shark as far as you know the actual money that they were trying to get out of their victim. And this is really because they knew they were going after a business. They knew the business had critical data that they needed access to, and they were likely to pay uh, a significant amount of money for this, you know, to get this data back. You know, over the course of a few days, 
the you know the folks at the Hollywood Presbyterian uh, negotiated the the ransom down from 3.4 million, and they ended up paying roughly seventeen thousand uh, dollars for you know to get the decryption keys back. Uh, and what the what was encrypted, it wasn't um, you know the the way ransomware usually works in this case and, and with, you know, actually most cases, not, you know, I won't, don't want to say all, but most cases the, the data isn't actually sto uh, stolen. So there there wasn't patient or healthcare data that was stolen. Uh, it was just, uh, you know, locked out from, you know, the doctors and the healthcare providers. Uh, and there was a uh, report that it wasn't the, the data that was stolen. It was the, they were locked out of systems that allowed the doctors and the healthcare providers to document and transfer healthcare data. So they're, all their patients uh, that were there, uh, they couldn't accept any more patients, and they diverted patients to um, to other hospitals. Chris, did you have any uh, information on this one that you'd like to, to add? Yeah, from my perspective, um, the interesting thing for this is that it really puts the spotlight on system availability. Um, there's very standard approaches to protecting that from backups through whatever you do for disaster recovery. I think the point here is that it's really come to the fore now, um, and you need to be making sure that it isn't just that it says that you're doing those things on paper, but you need to be actually making sure you are doing them, um, and you're actually testing that they work. So running this as a new scenario to where you suddenly lose access to a system and how you recover from that, because this is definitely a business model that isn't going away in the short term for the criminals. Um, and just because you pay up once doesn't mean it isn't going to happen again. Yeah, very interesting. So, uh, you know, one of the things there is that you mentioned that it's it's not going away anytime soon. And I think the important thing to realize there is that one of the reasons it's not going away anytime soon is that it's very profitable for you know, criminals and cyber criminals to to run ransomware schemes across uh, the array of internet. Right, we've seen consumers being you know victimized for years. Now we're seeing businesses. Uh, I don't think there's really any end game uh, that we're going to see you know happen anytime soon. And I've actually found a picture of one of the uh, you know ransomware authors that we've you know found on the internet. Right, and this is them. They're sitting in their big pile of money. Um, there was a, a Trustway report uh, in 2015, I believe it was, that estimated the average ransomware campaign uh, has a 1,425% return on investment for uh, criminals. Uh, they usually saw about a $6,000 investment upfront cost to get the infrastructure up, pay for the malware, uh, and actually start deploying the malware to their victims. And from that $6,000, they would uh, usually make about eighty-four thousand dollars in returns, right? So, when we look at you know one of the reasons that attackers pay, and I think um, you know Chris brought this up a second ago, is that it's a business justification, right? So for businesses, uh, it's not the emotional connection of their data that uh, consumers have; it's a, a you know a financial uh, connection to that data. And it's you know the CEO of the Hollywood Presbyterian here, he put it really really good in that. Uh, it, the quickest and most, and most efficient way to, to get your systems back online sometimes is to just pay for those decryption keys, right? Even though you have the backups, and we know, you know, we've known for years that if you get infected with malware, the, the easiest way is to just restore from a, a known good backup. Um, and that's how you'd, you'd get back up and running. But from a business standpoint, you know, is it cheaper to store from your backups and go through that whole instant res response procedure, or is it cheaper to pay you know, the ransom of a few hundred to a few thousand dollars to get your decryption keys back and you decrypt your data and you, you know, you move on with your business. All right, so, um, you know, if you look from the backup theory, I usually tell people there's a, a good backup theory that was taken from disaster recovery called the, the 3 two, one backup theory, meaning that you want three copies of your data, you want those backups to be on two different types of data mediums, you know, CDs or hard disk or tape, uh, and then with one of those being offline, right? And that usually prevented against, um, you know, a, a data center going offline or, you know, a, a disaster hitting like an earthquake and a building completely collapsing and you lose all of your data. But it has, 
parallels to being able to recover from ransomware, right? So if you have your ransomware and you have multiple copies of your data, even though we have seen ransomware target uh, backup data as well, if you have that data in a you know location that isn't available to you know this automated ransomware, you're going to be much more likely to be able to recover that data. You know, meaning being in the offline, uh, different location, completely network segmented, as you know, opposed to a uh, you know, a, an attached CD drive or a, a mounted uh, share on the network. All right, what, you know, what are your thoughts on that, Chris? Yeah, I mean, being able to do it correctly, and um, that's why I say testing, um, because companies need to be able to work out um, the operational risk. It's just yet another operational risk for any business. What's the quickest way for the least impact, for the least cost? Um, so we can get on with our job. If you've got good backups where you can recover them, you know, in a, a period of minutes or hours for that system, and what we're talking about here is, is um, people, processes, and technology. It isn't necessarily about getting one system back if it's doing transactional stuff, if it's, um, if it's integrated with other systems, if data's moving through it, if it's being processed. So it does become a complex thing um, as to whether your backups, whether your disaster recovery is actually effective, but it is doing the math on that. Um, you know, if you have someone who truly comes in with a $3.4 million ransom, and that is a hit to your bottom line, um, having something that you have a capability already and making it effective is probably um, the best cost way to do it. If you can get away with $17,000 and you get recovered within a reasonable amount of time, that's a lot less um, than from a business perspective um, that, you know, works. However, with that second one, you are feeding a criminal business model. So you are keeping them incentivized as to this operation. And until that incentive goes away, until the ROI on it diminishes, it's going to keep going. Yeah, and I, I think there's something that um, a lot of people may not realize as well is, uh, you know, there's a lot of security researchers that are going through and reverse engineering malware, and they, you know, they do this every day to figure out how it works. But even though the encryption that these attackers are using is, you know, high-grade encryption that we're seeing used in enterprises and governments and things like that. Um, the implementation may be flawed, right? So there are resources like nomoransom.org that you can go to and see if the you know the particular ransomware strain that you've been hit with uh, has been reverse engineered. And if it has, the decryption keys may be available absolutely free to you. So this is a really good resource for anybody that has been infected with ransomware. And you can either upload a copy of your, you know, one of your encrypted files. You can upload the ransom note, uh, you know, just say what the, you know, the Bitcoin address or any email addresses or web, you know, websites that are listed in your ransom note to this website. And they'll say, um, you know, yeah, we have a decryption key or no, we don't. And, you know, it might be a way to, you know, not go through a disaster recovery process, whether that's um, either not implemented or too expensive to go through and get encryption keys and get back up, you know, the business back up and running very quickly. So while we have white hat researchers looking at ransomware, we saw uh, a huge amount of news cycles uh, around the San Bernardino shooter's iPhone and how the FBI wanted to hack into that as well. Um, so, you know, the details behind this one is the, you know, the terrorist that was, you know, that shot, um, that was the active shooter in San Bernardino had an iPhone uh, 5C on his person when you know the when all of the evidence was recovered. Uh, he did have a personal phone that was destroyed uh, prior to his attacks. Um, so the you know, the FBI wanted to get information off of this specific phone. All right. So this is a, a, a phone that was issued from his work, um, and it did have the feature enabled that uh, the iOS has that if you enter in too many passcodes incorrectly, it completely wipes the phone. So they couldn't go through and do a brute force attack on, you know, the the code saying, you know, 0000, 0001, 0002, um, and very quickly they, you know, wiped the phone and they'd never have access to that any data, data anymore. So what the FBI wanted was for Apple to create a custom version of the iOS that only the, you know, the FBI or uh, authorities would have access to, 
and it would disable that feature. So even if you know the user had enabled the the you know the wipe feature with too many incorrect guesses, uh, the software would be, allow authorities to disable that feature. And then the second component was to eliminate the software delay between incorrect guesses. So there is an actual hard-coded you know, delay between guesses when you enter in an incorrect guess. It might be a few milliseconds or a few seconds um, that is going to slow down the amount of guesses that you can do you know, per second or per minute, uh, however often you can do it. And this is really designed uh, in you know, not only the iPhone, but quite a few you know, pieces of software to prevent brute force attackings and slow down uh, you know, these large machines from being able to guess this account. So they wanted this type of uh, attack, or sorry, uh, iOS version for the phone, uh, not actually breaking encryption or, or so to speak. And, and the way the San Bernardino police put it is, Apple is like a guard dog, and we want Apple uh, to remove the vicious dog so we can pick the lock to the door. And I think that's an interesting, you know, comparable there, that they want to be able to, uh, you know, not break encryption. I think that was what a lot of the news cycles were for, but um, just you know bypass some of the protections, which I you know I still think is, is a little dangerous. You know, and at the end of the day, uh, it's believed FBI paid uh, roughly a million dollars for a zero-day exploit to get into the phone. Um, after which they you know they said as they expected they didn't find any actionable intelligence on this phone. You know, what do you think about this, Chris? Um, yeah, um, bizarre is the one word I have for this. Um, there's a standard history of law enforcement going to technology companies um, and asking in specific cases for access to be acquired to a system. Um, the engineers at organizations often know a surprising number of ways to get into systems. Um, and th there's interesting ways that are documented that you just wouldn't think of. So trying to turn this into something where it became a sort of political battle between D.C. and the Bay Area um, it just became a fascinating sort of security theater around um, all sorts of privacy issues and everything. So. Um, I, I mean, in terms of getting the zero day, um, that kind of is the standard approach or getting engineers within an organization subject to um, standard case requirements, that's the standard approach to sort of expand it um, to where the only response they was going to get is no, um, I just found incredibly strange. Yeah, and I think uh, you brought up a good point that there were specific resources that you know law enforcement have that they you know want to have access to, and that, that made me think is that you know the the key component around this you know debate between the FBI and Apple was that the FBI said, well, it's just you know this one phone that we you know we need access to, and you can create the software for you know that's locked down to this you know, UID of this phone. Uh, but you know, on you know back channels, there were there was reports that you know law enforcement in New York had you know hundreds of phones, you know iPhones that they wanted Apple to unlock if this was going to be uh, you know released and available to law enforcement. So uh, I think it really turned into um, you know this rabbit hole that they didn't want to to go down to to weaken encryption because I think you know from the you know apple standpoint the security and the privacy of you know their users you know for the the data that they have on their phone is a competitive advantage for them you know over uh you know other devices and other you know opportunity or other you know phones that consumers can have yep completely agree i mean if if i buy a device i've got some expectation that the vendor of that device is some has some role as a custodian um, for protecting my interests. I mean, the, the capabilities of any law enforcement is going to be the capabilities they have. That's just something to expect. Um, but having a, a vendor just sort of provide a golden key um, to organizations that approach them and, and extends well beyond. I mean, um, the, the the governments have put pressure. Uh, the governments other than the U.S. government have put pressure on vendors to do that, so that you know they can investigate civil rights move. I mean, once you begin to sort of open um, 
this issue up, it, it becomes a, a very broad issue in so many ways very quickly. So it's it's very easy to sort of polarize um, the context for it. But you know, just as an approach and setting this kind of precedent, it becomes a very difficult issue very quickly. Yeah, very good. So, you know, speaking of zero days and, you know, how, you know, the FBI reportedly pay for one, there have been, you know, these what we call name brand vulnerabilities that, you know, were zero days that have been reported, you know, starting all the way back in 2014 with things like Heartbleed and Shellshock that were, you know, making national headlines. And, you know, I have, you know, my mom asking me, you know, what is Heartbleed? And I'm like, how did you know about that, mom? So, you know, we saw that, you know, the continuation through 2015 and 2016, we saw uh, one early in the year and around, uh, I think the, the news cycle has really started around this one in, in May, about a month before, saying there is a major vulnerability coming out, you know, that, that's called bad lock, and it's going to be with the, the implementation of Samba. And there was a lot of uh, anticipation around this one from, you know, administrators of, you know, Windows devices and, you know, what do we need to do? How bad is this going to be? Uh, you know, because it was dubbed as the next, uh, the next heart bleed or the next shell shock. And when it came out, you know, we see the information here. The the CVSS scores were were you know rather mild. You know, they had their medium scores of either you know 5.8 or 6.8, depending on what version you scored it at. Um, and then the the security bulletin from Microsoft rated this as important, not even critical. The reason being is that you know it's not this remote executable. You know, vulnerability that can be done anywhere over the internet, you know, all a heart bleed and shell shock. Uh, this is a man in the middle attack against, you know, these devices running Samba that, you know, allowed you to, you know, steal, you know, information about. And I think, you know, because of this, afterwards everybody said, okay, it's not as bad, you know, you still should, you know, fix this type of thing. But uh, from, you know, from my standpoint, I think it created a little bit of backlash over these name brand vulnerabilities and you know this one happened and at least was you know released on you know patch Tuesday and back in April 12th and in the last eight months now we haven't seen any name brand vulnerabilities you know so to speak of that have you know come out you know even though we've had uh, you know dozens if not hundreds of very critical vulnerabilities in Windows and you know other operating systems you know seen on the market. Yeah, and um, no offense to Kate or other marketing people out there, but I, this really is sort of um, a brand marketing tool rather than um, a way of alerting people to what's going on, on out there. There are standard channels for making sure that people are aware of uh, critical security issues, and those are the tried and trusted methods. Those are the ones where we're getting the information. Um, there are sources out there. There's established security research resources that you can go to to get more details. The problem with this is that you end up with um, a media hype that goes well beyond the security community. You end up with people who don't necessarily understand the implications that are driving this. You have whole management chains in large organizations going, when are we going to fix this? When are we going to fix this? It breaks your standard response processes. Um, stretched security organizations have to react to what is something driven outside of their normal process rather than based on risk assessment. Um, and there's a, a huge risk that you end up patching something where you could be spending your time somewhere else. But the problem is, is that if anything happened because you didn't patch one of these, um, you will, you know, you're going to be dragged across the coals for doing it, even though you'd be able to argue from a risk standpoint um, that it wasn't a high priority or whatever. Um, people just don't want to deal with the, the potential of that. Um, so the sooner these things go away, I, I'm sort of glad that they went quiet. Um, one thing I will add, ironically, because it's the, the last one I dealt with um, before moving from security operations to the product side of things, I actually do believe that for Heartbleed, um, it, it probably was the right thing. Um, 
the more that we had security researchers driving that um, a lot and getting the awareness around that. And that was just more because of the the technical issues around what the potential impact was. My concern is that that, pro that one probably would have lingered more than it has without that kind of um, media push behind it. Yeah, and the one thing you said that I think really sticks out is that, um, you know, why patch, you know, something like, you know, this when you could be spending your time doing something else that is, that is more valuable. Um, and, you know, I like to look at, you know, how FEMA addresses disasters, right? So what we're seeing here is uh, really, you know, a heat map, so to speak, of where is the most hazardous places in the United States where an earthquake is likely to hit, or sorry, hit, excuse me. Um, so what this allows them to do you know, is take historical data um, from, you know, where earthquakes we've seen and be able to anticipate the next one, right? We don't know when the next earthquake is going to hit, just like we don't know when the next, uh, you know, high-impact vulnerability or uh, attack against our organization is going to hit. Um, but knowing, you know, what they might be after uh, allows us to anticipate the attack or, you know, anticipate an earthquake, uh, you know, place mit mitigating factors in place. So, you know, you look at places like San Francisco in the Bay Area, which has very high you know, standards for you know, earthquake safety for their buildings, um, which, you know, because they know that this is, you know, potentially going to happen to their, their things. Uh, and it allows you to, you know, have a response team, you know, nearby and, and have a response uh, team that is trained to, to respond to these events and uh, be able to continually, you know, test your responses, you know, which translate in, into, you know, the enterprise world if, you know, how can we, you know, adopt this into our world, right? So we have a, you know, heat map of, you know, our enterprise environment, right? So we see that attackers we know are going to be going after our front end systems, right, our, our web servers and uh, email servers, you know, anything that's externally facing to the environment. Um, and then, you know, the data that they're after is in our, you know, back end systems or, you know, our databases which have, you know, proprietary information, confidential information, customer information, healthcare information, you know, whatever it is that, uh, you know, whatever valuable data our company has, right? So it allows us to take those same, you know, aspects of, you know, we can anticipate that the attackers are going to be after these types of machines and after these types of data um, and anticipate that and, you know, be able to, you know, plan for, for that and, you know, test our responses to say when an event happens, whether it's an attack that we detected or a high-impact vulnerability comes out, uh, we know what to do. So when a high impact vulnerability comes out, it doesn't matter if it's a name brand vulnerability. Uh, it doesn't matter if the you know the severity you know the CVSS score is you know 10 or if it's 0 0.10. Right? We know uh, what to do and how to address it based off of what's important to uh, us as a business to continually to operate. Sorry, I was on mute. Um, just to sort of say something that organizations forget is that um, vulnerability management is about managing vulnerabilities. It isn't just about applying patches. So if you've got a large organization, a complex organization, having strategies around what you do for what systems when a vulnerability comes out, whether it's patching critical systems immediately, whether it's concentrating on having very good test um, processes so that you know what potential impact is to systems, or whether you have mitigations that are ready to go as well, so that you know you know what are your fragile systems, your brittle systems that you don't want to be applying patches to just because CNN says you should, um, and being able to go through that and justify and educate your management in advance so that when they sort of hear these fire alarms going off through the media, when you actually say, we've done our due diligence, we've assessed them, this is what we're doing in response to it, they're ready for that kind of answer rather than just sort of listening to um, everyone else, what they're saying across all the media channels and not being able to say, yes, we've patched our system. So. Yeah, good thoughts. So, you know, here in America, the the big event this year was the election, right? So there was a lot of you know, news cycles, not only 
um, and you know, just around the election, but uh, around how you know people were interfering with the election and potentially you know you know affecting the the results. Um, so we saw you know earlier and you know way before the any uh, candidates were you know officially nominated that the Democratic National Committee had been attacked uh, and they were hacked uh, multiple times. Um, so there was a, you know, the first attacker that got in there um, that was in the DNC environment for well over a year from, you know, the, you know, what we saw, and they were siphoning communications, so uh, internal emails, uh, you know, what were the, uh, what was the Democratic National Committee talking about, what was their, you know, what were their strategies uh, for their, you know, their internal candidates um, that they were trying to, to promote. Um, and then the second uh, attacker uh, had been in there as well, completely different from the first attacker. Um, that was, you know, from all records, had been in there for a few months. And what they were doing was stealing all of the research against uh, Donald Trump. Uh, so at this point, Donald Trump hadn't yet been named the Republican nominee. But, you know, from a political standpoint, uh, Trump was, and in, in some aspects still is, uh, an unknown in the political landscape. So uh, whoever was going after this data wanted to, you know, get information about what, as Americans, you know, what we thought about him, you know, how he operated, how we, you know, how we expected him to act uh, on the international landscape, you know, if he were to be a nominee and or the, the president. You know, we, we look at how this attack happened and, uh, you know, with the data they were after and, and what they were getting after and, you know, what they wanted to do with this data. Uh, it's, you know, all indications believe it's from, you know, some, uh, you know, Russian-affiliated group, um, although, you know, we say believe to because, you know, attribution is it's hard to do. And I don't want to just, you know, pick on the, the DNC at all. The, the actual, the Republican uh, committee as well were, were also hacked, uh, but instead of sealing, you know, data and communications, they were after their credit card data. Um, so it shows you, there, you know, there's a couple different motives there that, that show that these are two, you know, two different groups that are going after, you know, the Republicans versus the Democrats. You know, one's after data, uh, the other one is after financial gain, um, for, you know, for credit card information. But I think, you know, my main takeaway from from all of this is it really brought cybersecurity um, to the the forefront of you know political topic, and I think it was the first time that we've ever seen. Uh, you know, debate, you know, national debates for the presidents that the, you know, cybersecurity was an important topic and, and how are we going to address this going forward as a nation as opposed to it being something that, you know, IT departments, you know, had to deal with on their own in, you know, co uh, corporations across the world. Yeah, I think that's a really good point. I mean, cybersecurity is being part of national security. I think a lot of lip service um, is done to that. What I mean by that is more that people not understanding the implications or how far-reaching it actually is. Um, subversion of political processes is straight out of the espionage playbook. It's been done for forever if you look through history. Um, you know, just looking at ways to destabilize different governments or, you know, democracy, voting processes, whatever it is. Um, and what you're seeing gradually is just as you saw um, Iranian nuclear reactors being taken out by software rather than jets dropping bombs on them, which was the case sort of um, 20, 30 years earlier. Um, so you saw that move from a military intervention to a cyber intervention. Um, you know, subversion of political processes, putting activists in situations, you know, trying to get data that way, information that way. If you can get the same effect by just stealing data from a system and then posting it online, um, it is a lot easier. So seeing this migration of the espionage playbook from sort of the real world to the cyber world, I think that's just something people are going to have to accept. And I think the understanding that and sort of having your your counter espionage being based on that, you know, has got to be a key point and understanding that, you know, critical assets are going to be part of that. So from a security perspective, um, a lot of organizations and even countries that would never have considered this a possibility um, really need to review their threat models and ask themselves if they're a target of a state-sponsored hack. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, you know, we look at, you know, what we call, you know, state-sponsored hacks and, you know, how are we trying to get this data? Um, you know, I've had a lot of good conversations around, you know, cyber threat intelligence and, 
um, you know, when we're looking at things like TTPs and, you know, the tactics, techniques, and procedures, and how we identify malware and be able to, you know, find it on our systems, uh, all the way up to higher levels to, you know, companies that really want attribution and uh, and why they want it. And um, I really, you know, consider the, you know, cyber threat intelligence to be really, a, you know, a triad of you can only get certain aspects, right? Either you can get it fast, you can get it um, accurate, uh, or you can uh, get attribution, right? So. Uh, attribution takes a lot of time, uh, and there's reasons why, right? Attribution isn't as simple as an IP address in, uh, you know, China was in your log, so you know that China attacked you, right? The people can attack from any number of the world. They can have distributed uh, attack vectors. Um, so we have to, you know, really reverse engineer this malware, see how it's written, look at uh, the language that's used in it. Um, you know, in the, the case of the, the Democratic National Committee data, we saw that their data was uh, translated um, into, into acrylic and then um, posted back online. Um, and then we saw certificates that were reused from previous attacks that we know um, were used by certain groups. Um, and so, you know, we just take all of this information into account and we, we try to, you know, piece enough clues together to, to remove reasonable doubt. Um, you know, so if we take all this information, we can say, you know, okay, we know that uh, certain nation states uh, may be behind uh, one attack or another, uh, but it's very hard to, to remove the question mark and put a human behind a keyboard, um, which is why we don't really see quite as often uh, actual, you know, criminal cases against uh, hackers. So um, if we look at, you know, how hackers work, uh, this is a, a slide that, that Apple presented at Black Hat in uh, uh, July, August timeframe this year. Uh, and they're stepping into the, the bug bounty uh, world uh, for uh, security researchers. So, you know, we've talked already today about, you know, zero days and, you know, how, you know, the FBI might pay for them or, you know, criminals might be paying for these or, or swapping them out. There's a whole other market where security researchers can uh, historically would just, you know, find uh, vulnerabilities or bugs and uh, submit them to a company and the company would fix it. Uh, you know, over the past uh, few years, we've seen, a, you know, an uptick in the number of uh, bug bounty programs where a company will pay uh, anywhere from a few hundred dollars to, you know, we can see here Apple is willing to pay up to $200,000 for security researchers and white hats to find these, you know, critical vulnerabilities and report them you know, responsibly and get, you know, get paid for it. And what they're really trying to do is compete with the black market and allow, you know, these security researchers to still get paid um, by still following their, you know, their morals and ethics as, you know, a security researcher to not do any harm to to the world in general. Yep, and I think that's the key point here. I think organizations need to be able to discover vulnerabilities through whatever means makes sense for them. Um, and it's good to see key platform vendors stepping up in this way. Um, you know, they've been getting free services for a long time um, from security researchers. So it, it's nice that they are giving opportunity to security workers to be, uh, security researchers to be compensated for their work. Um, the thing about the broker model is really interesting to me. I mean, we know that there's a black market in these things. We know that there's sort of exchanges for these things. We know that there's identified brokers. Um, for vulnerabilities. So there's a lot of different ways to sell and there's a, diff a lot of different price tags for these. Um, my assumption is that um, we would see more monitoring of these services that are outside of the vendor stuff, you know, by law enforcement or whatever. Um, whether to acquire those for um, domestic needs, domestic organizations, or whether just to be tracking what's going on. So I think that thing of giving security researchers what is an ethical outlet to actually be able to get remuneration for their work, I think that's an excellent thing. Yeah, and I think you know we're seeing a lot more researchers uh, enter this market where now that they can, they know they can get paid, they you know they are doing the research and reporting it. Um, and, you know, we're seeing, you know, a lot more bug bounty programs out there as well. You know, you look at uh, resources like HackerOne or BugCrowd, uh, which, you know, can, you know, organize these types of events and, you know, put all this information in a centralized location. 
and we, you know, we're having more security, uh, you know, bug bounty programs than there are uh, security researchers to, you know, report and find these things. And I think that's driving the price up. While you're seeing uh, it go up from, you know, a pat on the back and a, you know, note on their website to actually financial, you know, gain for these researchers from, you know, hundreds to thousands to hundreds of thousands of dollars to, to get eyes on on this type of stuff. But one of my one of my coworkers brought up that um, I wanted to ask you, Chris, is you know could you know as you if you set up a bug bounty program, do you feel that this could be you know an attack system to a you know as a as a software vendor where a malicious user is bombarding the you know vendor with uh, you know bogus you know you know uh, issues whether they're bogus or very less severe while they keep their uh, you know, more severe zero day, you know, to themselves so that, you know, you're spending cycles fixing these non-critical things, um, you know, from the vendor standpoint. What are your thoughts on that? Well, well, if it wasn't, it is now. Um, <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I'm, uh, I think the thing is, is that most of the vendors, I mean, they've got very established um, processes for how they identify and work on vulnerabilities. My hope is that they extend those processes to what they're actually getting as inputs. Um, you know, so the the other thing is a lot of vendors actually develop re relationships with specific um, security researchers. Um, finally, there's a lot of um, open source intelligence out there that the vendors may not be playing into, but they will actually get access to. So there's security research companies that are doing um, a lot of intelligence gathering around, you know, who's developing what vulnerabilities, where, where there's a belief. Because if you have a key platform and you have a vulnerability, there's often still chatter um, around what's going on. So for some of the key things that have come out in the past, there's been chatter within the community, um, security community, you know, months before things have actually come out where it's just sort of like, hey, there's this thing affecting this system. Um, so my hope is that vendors either are plugged into that so that they can eliminate a lot of the noise or they'll be looking to do that. Or if that is not something that's easily done, then they'll probably actually become an extension of a service for some of these open source intelligence organizations. Nice. Um, so for anybody playing webcast bingo, let's discuss uh, the Mirai botnet and how that's really emerged over the last couple of months. Um, so we saw in September the the largest ever denial of service attack uh, go against Brian Krebs' website. And for those that don't know Brian Krebs, I highly recommend you, you check out his website. Um, great news there. But we saw things of you know 600 and some odd uh, gigabit per second denial of service attack. And, uh, it was mounted from the Internet of Things devices, you know, devices that had been uh, hacked where, you know, the researchers aren't going through and uh, reporting these to the, the vendor. They're actually exploiting them themselves. You know, before we'd see, you know, large denial of service attacks, we'd see these as, you know, amplification and reflection attacks where uh, we spoof the, our, our target's uh, website or IP address uh, to, you know, a vulnerable DNS or NTP server asking for, uh, you know, some data about, you know, the service. And we'd send a couple kilobits to the NTP server, and the NTP or DNS server would respond with, you know, megabytes or gigabytes of data to our, our device. So you spread this across a bunch of, you know, NTP servers, and you can amplify from a couple kilobits up to a few hundred gigabits. You know, but this was just not, you know, this type of attack. It was just the sheer number of these, you know, Internet of Things devices that we've seen on the environment uh, just attacking a single, you know, person that was part of a botnet. You know, then the attacker a few weeks later released the source code and said, you know, here's how it's done, here's how we did it, and we saw that it was taken you know, over these devices using default credentials that had never been changed. Uh, and we saw competition for from a, the attacker standpoint to, to use this stuff, right? There was rumors that Liberia was knocked offline by the botnet. Uh, we're not sure if that is actually true or not, um, but, you know, we do know that it did bring down very, you know, powerful and uh, companies like Twitter and Amazon, Reddit, GitHub, Netflix, right? So these companies have security resources and, you know, in place that, you know, they're doing all these great things to, to prevent this stuff. But the sheer number of these devices, right, we've seen here that there's a huge growth in these types of devices um, that, you know, 
the vendors of these devices aren't, you know, implementing security, you know, correctly some of the times, right? Many of the IoT devices are from, you know, very well-known providers, right? They know, you know, how to do security, they do security right, but there's also a lot that are fly-by-night operations, right? There are going to be devices which are using outdated code, shared code from, you know, Stack Exchange that, you know, is known to be vulnerable, and they release the device and they never do anything about it. And I think that's going to be a, a big problem going forward for, you know, not only companies, but uh, consumers as well. Yeah, so <laughs> it's interesting here. I mean, denial of service attacks had kind of gone out of vogue. Um, I'm going to date myself a bit here, but I was actually doing security when Mafia Boy managed to take out Yahoo, AOL, I believe, and others. Um, and you had Yahoo engineers having to deal with other companies who were actually accusing Yahoo of attacking them um, because they couldn't read their logs. Um, you know, the the security um, community matured around denial of service attacks, ISPs did, so the handlers, the carriers, and the standard attacks actually became pretty much um, a, a known problem um, with a standard solution. And denial of service, distributed denial of service, you'd see them pop up, but they'd kind of disappear. Um, the, the beauty of this is that you're talking about uh, systems that are in consumers' homes or wherever, millions of devices, and the traffic, where they're coming from, if they're from consumers, they're not people you just want to knock off the internet. You don't want to just knock a million people off the internet. Um, because that begins to break the service models of the internet. So this is a very interesting problem to solve um, as to how it's going to be. The the other thing here is that, I mean, you'd have expected this to be in a good science fiction or in a Hollywood movie first, but the evolution of the Internet of Things has beaten them to the punch and that we've actually got it in the real world um, before we've got it in fiction. Yeah, and I think one of the reasons, or not one of the reasons, one of the ways we can fix this is how we update these devices, right? And I classify these devices into either one of these four classes of, of how they work, right? So uh, starting in the top right, you know, devices that auto-update, where they continually call home and they, they get their updates whenever they're available and they install them automatically. Um, there, there is, you know, a device, you know, the, the Nest thermostat, which does this really well that I have in my house, that it, it calls home, it does the uh, updates for me. And um, I don't have any control over stopping them, interacting with them, delaying them. Uh, it just doesn't. The only thing I know is, you know, what version I have on my device. All right. And then there's things, you know, like uh, notifying the user down on the bottom right that a device is available, whether that's through emailing them or notifying them because they've registered the device. Uh, they log into the device and they see that the, the update is available, right? I've had uh, routers that do this. Uh, as soon as I log in, it says, you know, we're checking for updates. And, you know, yes, there's one available. Do you want to install it? Um, you know, then, you know, going to the top left of having to manually search, and I, you know, have devices like this in my house as well, that I don't get notified, they don't automatically call home to tell me that there's an update available, um, but I have to go through to the website and find the vendor's website, find their support page, uh, enter in my device, make sure it's, you know, what firmware version is the latest on their website, what firmware version is, you know, on my web, you know, is mine running, and then uh, do the, the logic if I need to update it. And finally, there's tons of devices that are out there which are completely unsupported, whether they were before and now they're uh, older devices um, that are still being used. And, you know, there's not going to be any updates available. So when, you know, the heart bleeds and the shell shocks come out, these devices are going to be vulnerable to it. But there's, you know, really nothing, you know, we can do about it from, you know, the device owner perspective besides uh, maybe put it on a, another network segment and uh, hope that nobody gets access to it. And I think you know, one of the reasons um, that we've seen Microsoft, right, so now we're seeing Microsoft go through, and they've, as of October, they changed their Windows update procedure. So now they're, they're following their, their Windows 10 model of individual updates uh, each month. So instead of logging in and, you know, see on the left-hand side, right, they're trying to get rid of this problem where you log into your computer and you see you have 200 and, you know, some odd updates and you have to, you know, manually click on each one you want to install. And, 
uh, they saw a lot of users not install this stuff, right? So now they're going to, to things, uh, you know, on the right. You see, you know, on the right-hand side there, there's a screenshot from the Patch Tuesday from yesterday where now there's just an individual patch available, and they say, um, you know, here is Novem November's patch or December's patch, and it's all of the, the updates available for this month. If you missed last month or any months before, uh, here you go, you get an individual patch, right? And I think it's really great for consumers that they're going to be able to uh, simplify their update process and right, not delay patches. And, and I think for the security as a whole, right, we're going to prevent things like the, the Mirai botnet where devices aren't being updated because users aren't going through and updating the devices themselves. Um, you know, as, as much as we can make updating more simple for users, I think that's better. Yep, completely agree. Simple for consumers, for your end users, is always a good thing. Um, yes, it probably raises some concerns for commercial organizations, but I think it's good if it's pushing them into um, patching their systems or getting their vulnerability management performing. Yeah, I think this is a, a good slide to, to uh, discuss why it's important that we make this simple. All right, so here are the, the numbers that we've seen as of uh, yesterday afternoon for the number of vulnerabilities uh, that have been reported. Right, So there's going to be even more th than this that aren't even reported, but here's the ones that we know about. And you know, even though we see 2016 for the CVE scores, you know, we're, we're not quite to 2015 levels. Right, We still have two weeks left, and I, I'm guessing that by the end of the year we're going to surpass you know, the numbers we've seen here. But you know, if we look on the bottom there, that the the Microsoft security bulletins were just you know skyrocketing with the the number of security bulletins that we've seen um, that they're fixing and reporting, right? And even though the important and moderate, the lower level ones, you know, aren't to the numbers they were the year before, the you know the critical ones are even more, right? We're seeing almost double than we saw in 2015, right? So, I mean, Chris, is this because they're scoring them differently? I mean, you've gone through and scored vulnerabilities. What do you what do you think the reason is here? <laughs> oh, I'll, I'll I'll say I don't have a clue on that one. So there's, there's a lot of different potential reasons. I think the basic message is that, and this has been hammered home for years, you, you've got to assume that systems are vulnerable. They were vulnerable before a patch was released. They're going to be vulnerable up until you apply the patch. They're going to be vulnerable after you've applied the patch. So your security model has to factor that in. If, if your security model fails because of one missing patch, then you've got bigger problems. Yeah. So a, a couple of resources that I want to give people insight into that they may not know about, um, that I didn't know about until just recently. Um, so every month uh, when Microsoft releases their, their information and, and to their patches, right, they have their security bulletin page where you can go through and, and get information about their product. right? That's their, their TechNet page here. You can see the link on the top. Um, they're moving away from this model uh, coming in the beginning of the year. Uh, so now they're creating a portal um, at their, their MSRC, their, their response center that you, you know, have your account and you can get much uh, greater insight, they're hoping, into these vulnerabilities uh, that are being reported and fixed. You can have uh, custom uh, information on here to what's important to you or your business uh, to try to, to remove some of the FUD that uh, you are seeing in the marketplace. Um, so highly recommend anybody that is responsible or wants information on uh, security bulletins from Microsoft um, to, to Make sure that they're aware of the site when they transition from this uh, come 17. Chris, anything you want to add before we uh, we finish up today? No, nope. I'm good. Thanks very much. Okay, um, so I'm going to go ahead and uh, open this up to, to questions and answers. So if anybody has any questions um, that they'd like uh, answered based off of either today's topics or anything else. Um, that you know you saw in the marketplace, or you think might be happening, uh, go ahead and shoot those over now, and, and we'll we'll address them as they as they come in. So um, we have you know one question that came in a little bit earlier of you know how does a you know a company like a hospital uh, afford to do uh, recovery for things like you know ransomware and things like that, um, and I I think you know we saw in the case of the Hollywood Presbyterian is you know there are costs associated with recovering from security events and i think that uh, you know built into the the security budget for a team uh, if you know we saw that the initial ransom was 3.2 million and they paid 17,000 
um, you know, from my perspective, I assume that the cost of them recovering from ransomware and going through their incident response costed the company internally somewhere around seventeen thousand dollars, and you know that that was the sweet spot, you know, sweet spot for them, that they say we can afford to pay this, so we don't have to pay um, the internal costs associated with, um, you know, the res you know, responding to this type of event and getting our data back live. You know, what do you think, Chris? Yeah, I totally agree. So this is where operational risk comes in. Um, doing an analysis as to whether recovery is feasible, whether it's worth it financially or whatever is, you know, is the starting point um, before you start spending money on it. Um, this is very different from being hit by a hurricane or an earthquake where you've really got only one option as to how you continue services and things for something like a hospital. So there's many different ways out. Um, the, the other thing I'm expecting, which I haven't seen yet, is starting to see cyber insurance as a very specific thing for this. Um, cyber insurance for hacking is far more complex, but doing it for a single event like ransomware, I'd have thought the, I would think that the insurance companies would be able to do their actuarial models very well for that. And it may actually be worth contacting cyber insurance companies if you don't already have the coverage and just asking them, you know, are we covered for this? Does it come out of operational insurance or, or whatever? So funny out if there's some sort of coverage that way. But definitely agree, before you go through lengthy, expensive recovery exercise, do due diligence leading up to where that's the only option and that's what we've got to, got to do. I'm sorry, I was on mute. Um, does the, the FBI cr uh, paying for zero days create uh, a new market for criminal selling to law enforcement? And I think the short answer is yes. Uh, the longer answer being uh, yes, because that market's already been there. I think law enforcement has been paying for these vulnerabilities um, for for years, and they just never, you know, reported that, you know, on their on the you know their financial statements, right? So uh, I think that's always going to be out there. Yeah, and this is this is just another um, lens on criminal intelligence. Whether you're paying a snitch for information, whether you're paying a criminal to get a zero day, um, it's it's something that happens. It's a reality. Um, so here's an interesting one for you, Chris. Um, as opposed to brand, uh, brand name vulnerabilities, um, do you think that you know the the CVSS scoring um, is a better approach to to responding to these types of issues? <laughs> um, yes and no. I think CVSS is a very good starting point, but you sh your vulnerability management programs should be such that you look at the context within your environment. Um, if you've got 50 other controls other than applying this patch, you know maybe you maybe you can delay it. Maybe you can go away from it. Um, you know if your security is brittle. If it's or if it's a system that's exposed to the outside world, it's public web server or whatever, and it needs to be standing up, you know, then it, it may have a low CVSS score, but it may actually be in a patch that you need to apply. So it's very much guideline um, to do some sort of, um, uh, you know, triage from, but then applying your own risk for the context within your organization is what's key. Okay, so one last question before we uh, reach the end of the hour here. Um, from a cloud perspective, are attacks such as the one on uh, code space is increasing? You know, my answer to that one is I think attacks are going to increase wherever the valuable data is, right? So before, you know, historically the last, you know, 10, 15 years, we've seen data stored internally in, you know, company-owned data centers. As we see companies migrate that data from internally owned uh, systems to cloud-based uh, systems, I think that's where the attacks are going to go, and that's where we're going to see uh, criminals focus their efforts. What do you think, Chris? Yep, criminals are going to go where the, where the money is. Excellent. Uh, so that's uh, all the time we have for today. Uh, I thank everybody for coming, and I am going to turn it back over to Kate.
Thanks, Travis. Uh, and thanks both of our present presenters today, Travis Smith and Chris Conacher. Great information, guys. We're getting lots of compliments coming in and uh, really good information. Uh, thank you, our audience, for attending today. We hope you found the presentation informative and useful to you. As I mentioned earlier, I'll be sending out a follow-up email with a link to the on-demand version of this webcast and the, a link to the slide deck as well. And if you'd like to receive proof of attendance for being on the webcast today, please respond to that follow-up email. We hope that you'll join us for future webcasts next year in 2017. Check out the schedule at uh, tripwire.com. Also, check out our award-winning blog, The State of Security, to find the latest news in security as well as thought-provoking security topics. Thank you, and have a great day.